All right. Well, how is everybody doing so far? Loving this beautiful California weather? All right. We're going to talk about the future. So this is going to be a very interesting uh, situation. I was going to go ahead and just get into it right away. So, Anne, why don't we just start? We're, we're the flanking the men here. Let's kick it off. So let me just say that uh, one of the things that um, I think about is, with respect to your companies, I love that you have now helped us understand our DNA, our genome mapping. We all want to know that our healthy children are going to come out and live well. But we're also a little concerned, right, about are we going to be cast into a place if we don't have the right IQ? Are we going to be told we can't work in a certain place? So tell us a little bit for the audience what 23andMe means at today and what it means for the future of our life and our very existence. Great. Um, how many people here, I'm just going to show of hands, how many people here have actually spat before? In 23 me, I should say. Okay, good. Oh, good, so a lot of you. So, oh, how many people have spat for 23 and me? Which is, if you haven't, it means you haven't done it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, I'll answer the question for you. Um, so 23 and me is a company that um, is a direct-to-consumer genetic testing company. It was the idea that the genome revolution is here, that you know we're all going to be able to get access to our genome. It's a super exciting time. And 23andMe was founded on the principle that you, the individual, should be able to easily get access to your genetic information, that you shouldn't have to go through a doctor, you shouldn't have to go through a genetic counselor, that you should just be able to get access to it, and that you should be able to follow it as like a really exciting story that's sort of unraveling as we learn more and more about the genome that you'll be able to participate and you'll be able to see that. And one of the most exciting aspects of 23andMe is that we enable you then actually to use your genome to participate in research. So that there's this big mystery, what does your genome mean? So we can tell you a certain amount today, but now we have, you know, 1.4 million people and so we can actually start to do research. We can actually look and see, okay, all these people have asthma and this is the genetics of those individuals. Like, oh, is there a genetic risk factor for asthma? And then can we actually start to make those discoveries? So as your point is that the one of the things that we want to do is really be able to help people understand what their risks are. And the beauty of knowing what your risks are is then that you might actually be able to prevent them. And so if you knew that you were high risk for asthma, would you potentially live in an area that had less pollution? Would you potentially try to exercise more to do things to actually to try to mitigate that risk? So what are the types of things and the behaviors that you can do? And one of the things that we've seen is that people, when they know what their risks are, and they see something in black and white, it's meaningful. And we find that that actually changes behavior. So your question in terms of like, is everyone gonna be you know, sort of scripted and predisposed and people frequently bring up the movie Gattaca, I think one of the beauties of risk, or one of the beauties of 23andMe and of genetics is that it, it's risk-based. It means that you might have a risk factor, but it's not 100% deterministic. The same way if you know that your you know, parents are mathematicians, you, know, you might have a higher likelihood of being really good at that, but it's not determined that you're necessarily definitely going to be. And so there's always this ability that you're gonna be able to influence your life. And I think that's one of the things that um, we try to emphasize to individuals, that you can have a risk factor, but there's potentially things that you can do to mitigate those risks. You know, that said, I think that there's always, um, you know, going to be that concern of, you know, individuals potentially knowing, for instance, there's a sprinting marker. You know, are you only going to have certain individuals, you know, uh, doing certain sports because they find out something? And I think one of the things that we think about is it potentially will help individuals know more and more how to, you know, what they're potentially going to be better at if they're going to have a risk for something. Um, you know, one of the things I think a lot about, I just watched the movie Concussion, mm -hmm. and... Um, and, and there's some genetic data to suggest that individuals who have a risk factor for Alzheimer's are much more likely to have traumatic brain injuries in the future. So if that's true, I might in fact make that kind of choice to say, I'm not going to play football or I'm not going to have contact sports. Right. So I think in that kind of way, when it can be used actually for maintaining your health, I think it's gonna have a really positive benefit. But Anne, I would think that some here would say, uh, you know, that sounds like the intention, but there are always untended consequences. What about if our employer gets a hold of our information and says, you don't have a high propensity to deal in technology because you're not mathematical enough? How do we avoid these unintended consequences? How do you envision this technology to affect our lives five, ten years from now? Well, one of the reasons why we were, it was so important for us to be direct-to-consumer is that we believe strongly that it actually should be owned by you. 
and that the reality is that if you go and you have your insurance company pay for it or you get it through your physician, then they will own it. It's part of your record, and you don't necessarily always know exactly where that goes. But if you own the information, then you can control that. Um, the reality today is that there are genetic testing laws, or there's genetic information laws. So in the United States, there's the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So you cannot, your employers and health insurance cannot use it to discriminate against you. That said, it's not universal in the world. There's still lapses in the U.S., for instance, in um, um, uh, long-term care insurance. There's still not protection there. So there's definitely issues still, and I think that's something that the governments actually, if you want to enable people to get the benefits of knowing about their genome, there obviously has to be protections for it. Um, in countries where there's a single-payer system, I would argue that you can actually have a better system because if you have, if everyone was sequenced, let's say, at birth, and you actually knew, here's the group of kids who are all genetically high risk for macular degeneration which is the leading cause of blindness. And you would say, wow, sunglasses actually help minimize that risk. Would I actually then prioritize making sure that all these individuals have sunglasses? And because there is actually now a treatment, would I make sure that at 50, they actually start getting checks in their eyes and the rest of the population doesn't need it till 60s? I think you can start actually having healthcare be more risk-based. Like I just turned 40 now is a question, should I get a mammogram, should I not get a mammogram? And I ended up going and getting a mammogram in part because I have a genetic um, risk factor called BLM, which is Blooms. And there's guidelines that just came out that I am genetically higher risk. And they do, in fact, actually say women potentially now with this should actually get screened earlier. So I think that's the kind of example. Like healthcare will start to become more customized because in some ways when it's so generic, it's not meaningful. You know, all of us know you should exercise and you should eat well and you shouldn't smoke and da da da. Like, there's all these things, but if it's not meaningful and targeted towards you, it doesn't right. necessarily make sense. Right. Then I think that's where the genetics actually is going to make it potentially a lot more efficient. Okay, Daniel, you just heard Ann say that it's not deterministic and you are in the business of food and food that is better for you. What is the role of food and where do you see your company going and food in general? Uh, to prepare us for longer life and quality of life. So in case you don't know who I am, i the founder and CEO of a company called Kind, which makes healthy snack bars. How many of you have tried Kind bars? All right, you got it. Um, customers are, now they're asking for samples. Um, <laughs> how many of you have not tried? Those are the ones that I want to give samples to. <laughs> uh, so I absolutely do believe that there's a lot you can do and the doctors and scientists that I've consulted with over the last many years think that the number one thing we can do to fight the diabetes and obesity epidemics and all the corollary problems with cardiovascular risks and heart and stroke problems and stuff are better eating and just going back to nature and as standards of living increase, as education increases, I do think, I, I see it already for the last 10, 12 years, People are demanding more health food products. They also want more convenience. So for us, that's the intersection that you may be witnessing the huge explosion in products that fit the intersection between healthful and snacking things so that they're convenient to on, and on the go. I think that's just the beginning. I think that's going to increase. Hopefully, there will be a lot of shakeups and more education because there's also a lot of uh, misunderstandings about food, there's been a lot of <coughs> improvements in the way scientists understand nutrition, but there's still a huge gap between uh, what scientists know and what the community knows, and there's just a lot of opportunity to educate ourselves better and to avoid fads and the 30-day diet and the 10-day magic solution to lose all your weight and instead learn more of the fundamentals about how to uh, eat better. And I think the, the essentials to it are moderation, don't be an extremist in anything, uh, nutritionally rich foods rather than empty calories, so don't go for, for like silver bullet, like just because something is organic, if it's sugar, it's still sugar, so try to avoid high sugar products, try to avoid uh, stuff that's not found in nature, try to eat products whose ingredients you can see and pronounce. And <laughs> I think that uh, in the coming years, more and more people are going to be moving into that direction. It's starting to happen. And people are going to be really trying to put in their bodies things that they can recognize what it is that they're putting and that they can relate to it and hopefully not have to sacrifice taste for health. But 
Well, I hope that your future is exactly what we have because I do see now new products that you don't really know exactly what they are, but they're supposed to be, you know, just all the electrolytes we need and everything just combined in a certain way to make food very efficient as opposed to an experience. And so it will be interesting to see the involvement of food. Yeah, I, and everybody has their own philosophy, but my <laughs> personal philosophy is to prioritize real food rather than franken food. And... For me, Franken food is that is trying to look at like, okay, let me extract this special elixir of life from this thing and this other magical poach, potion and highlight this extra protein and this, and then you end up with a product that you cannot recognize, and but it's supposed to have all of those things and meet those check marks. And maybe if you live, for those that live in Africa, where we're not getting sufficient uh, vitamins and nutri nutrients into our bodies, designing those prototypical foods is useful, but in America we have the opposite problem. We're over consuming protein, we're over consuming carbs, we're over consuming sugar, we're over consuming all sorts of nutrients. The only things we're under consuming is fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. which is what you should be consuming the most of. Mm -hmm. So I think the, f f certainly for kind, the way we're approaching, the way we see the future is try to find things where you're only putting real foods into the things that you can recognize what it is and where you're, the number one ingredient in, your, in the products that you eat is nutritionally rich foods and where you're not just giving yourself empty calories. And as much as possible, eat fresh foods, eat vegetables, eat fruits. Thank you. Back to the basics. Thank you. Steve, yes, we, we just talked about the future and so your institution <laughs> created the mouse not the genome mapped mouse, but the, the one that we use in our computer every day uh, for some of us still. And so could you talk to us about how you see in the future us interacting with in artificial intelligence, with intelligence in general? How does that future look? I had an opportunity to visit your university and was really impressed with what you're doing and the advancements that you've made. What's the future in interaction, the way we learn, our capacity to learn, our capacity to eat? How will that change our ability to interact with things artificial? So, uh, and could you tell everybody about SRI? As sure. Well? So SRI stands uh, for, it used to be known as Stanford Research Institute. It was founded in 1946 here at the Stanford campus. They were celebrating 70 years this year. Um, we're now 2,000 people, uh, fantastic PhDs, masters, uh, other degrees. Uh, working in areas like education, biosciences, uh, engineering, uh, energy, and of course computer sciences. So we do an awful lot of different things. Uh, you mentioned one, the computer mouse, but a company called Nuance Voice Recognition Technology came out of SRI. Siri, if you use Siri, that was all invented at SRI. It was spun out as a, as a startup funded by uh, VCs here in the Valley and then bought by uh, Apple, Steve Jobs, uh, and now introduced into uh, the iPhone. So. We do an awful lot of things. We're well known for innovation. We love to innovate. And you're right, Administrator, uh, we love to be thinking about the future and applying our technology for our mission. We're not for profit, so our mission is to do good for society, to create uh, 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 technologies uh, and, and science that, uh, that uh, make the word world more productive, healthier, and safer. So, for example, um, I think you, you were in our robotics lab, as I remember, mm -hmm. and uh, we've just introduced into the marketplace a new company called Superflex uh, that has not only robotics technology, but a lot of artificial intelligence and a bunch of other technology that allows for adaptive, adaptive material robotics. So it's, it's to be placed uh, quite naturally on, on human beings. The elderly is, is certainly a, a big market uh, for us. Uh, kids with, with physical disabilities, um, all of you who might be uh, weekend athletes and have injuries and so forth might use uh, eventually this technology, these adaptive suits, exosuits, exo not, not uh, like uh, Iron Man, but they just look quite natural. They'll learn in terms of how you walk, your gait, your stride and so forth. They'll help the elderly get, a, get over cracks and bumps on uh, <laughs> sidewalks so they don't fall down. And it's just part of, uh, part of how we think. What is, what is going to be necessary in the future? And then adapting our technology to those kinds of things. Other areas, of course, uh, is a big effort that we've got in and around Internet of Things. Uh, as we all know, um, everything is going to get connected, processing equipment, pipeline equipment. Uh, all of you will have many, many connections in and around. And, of course, you want to have privacy, you want to have safety, you want to have security. 
And you want to not be thinking about those kinds of things constantly. You want to have um, a, a trusted uh, relationship with, with everything that you interact with. So we're working on those kinds of things so that that can be introduced uh, into, uh, into the various uh, customers and clients' uh, technologies that, that, that we have relationships with. And so, uh, you know, for example, one day uh, perhaps you'll be able to, I hope, walk through an airport without going through TSA, without going through maybe customs, um, and uh, information is uh, on the fly uh, provided that understands that you are a safe individual, safe for everybody around, mm -hmm. and you're able to go on like we all used to go on, or some of us who are old enough to know, to remember, mm -hmm. used to go on some of the flights from uh, many years ago, uh, last minute flights, and not have to wait two or three year, two or three hours, sometimes years Except in it line. feels like years, right? So, so like those, years. those are the kinds of yeah. things that we love working on and thinking about. Right, but Steve, now how many of you saw the movie Total Recall? Anybody here? Any? Okay, a few of you. So what happens, speaking of airports and luggage and everything, one of the things in this Arnold Schwarzenegger movie was that because the experience of traveling is so laden, you know, with pain points, that at the end of the day, what they did is they just implanted a memory, right? It was, do you want a trip? Do you want exotic? Do you want romantic? Do you want adventurous? And do you want it to be blonde, brunette, redhead? And so at the end of the day, after a trip, all we have is memories. So what is the future of, of uh, artificial intelligence? Is it carbon-based? And how, and again, the unintended consequences. You've seen that Wally movie where we all just sit there and we push a button and you know the soda shows up and the food and the drone shows up and delivers everything. What does that future look like and what are the unintended consequences you're concerned about? Well, of course, uh, people talk about robotics all the time and, and uh, uh, robots uh, getting as smart uh, as, as they are, uh, uh, technology uh, being what it is, and at some point in time, what sort of relationship do we have uh, with robotic uh, technology? So we, we concern ourselves with that you know, constantly. We have uh, sociologists and psychologists uh, who, who, who work in our, in our firm, not just uh, computer scientists. So. Uh, the fun thing about uh, about our our, uh, our institute is people like working with each other on these big challenges, and what we uh, intended to uh, to do is to is to try to uh, think through this so that when at least what our little world of what we deliver into the marketplace is very very thoughtful and is uh, equal to our mission. Um, we do know that uh, that as I mentioned, the elderly and other other uh, uh, various applications that we don't have time to go in, into today. Uh, are great for robotics technology, but at the same time, uh, um, they, they can be, uh, have, as you mentioned, uh, unintended consequences or harmful uh, effects, and we, we want to avoid that uh, as much as we can. So we're thinking about that all the time. Mm -hmm. Challenging. And so now, again, to Rob, excuse me, to Steve, um, in order to stay up with all of this, we have to think about how we're developing our mind, our intelligence to stay current, and to compete with robotics. Uh, my son, when he was four years old, and we were talking about inclusive, you know, I was just telling him about how to look at people and to think about the things we have in common. He said, Mom, don't even worry about it, because in the future, people are all going to connect, and they're going to be against the computers. That's the future. We're all going to be worried about the computers taking over our lives. And so we have to stay current. We have to stay up with the, all of these uh, technological developments. What do you see the future of education to be? The, what does the university look like? How do we learn? Could you describe, first of all, what you're doing at Singularity University? I love seeing your place. It was remarkable and meeting with you and engaging you. And what do you see for the future? That's a, that's a good question. So my name's Rob Nail. I, how, just a quick question. How many people have heard of Singularity University before? Whoa. Wow. Oh. Before you came here? That's great. Before you came here? Okay, well, wow. that's great. That's very that's amazing. Good. Especially as international as this group is, um, which is a good sign for us, I think. Um, so for the rest of you, Singular University, the mission is to educate, inspire, and empower leaders to understand the exponential pace of technology and how to apply it to solving humanity's grand challenges. So ultimately what I think we're doing is, is trying to build a global community that thinks differently about the future and how to engage in it. Um, technology is rapidly being democratized and putting incredible capability in everyone's hands everywhere around the world. Um, and so Singular University is the one place that you can go to explore where does this curve take us, what are the opportunities and implications of this curve, and do we like that? Is that where we want to take us, take ourselves, right? 
And if I think about education specifically, and I mean, we, we can go for 10 weeks. We actually just started our 10-week global solutions program where we selected 80 students from around the world. They live with us for 10 weeks at our facility at NASA Ames. And they learn about exponential technologies. They learn about the, what we call the grand challenges. And we bring thought leaders, some of these folks here, to talk about what, where we're going and what it means. And the second half of that program, they have to form teams and come up with an idea that's going to positively impact a billion people within 10 years. And the expectation is that's a real idea that's going to turn into a startup or a nonprofit that's going to go into our accelerator program and is going to become real. And, and so for us, today we've got about 45 startups that have come out, um, and I'm super proud of them. We can talk about that at another point. But um, interestingly, I feel like Singularity University, we're very much a non-traditional university, right? So a lot of people, why are you called a university? Well, on one hand, it's kind of an educational experience, you, a lot of thought, a lot of thought leadership. But more, I actually think we're trying to become a model for what I think the university should look like long term. Uh, we know this is going to happen. In five to ten years, everyone on the planet is con connected to the internet because of our, the work by companies like Google with the drones, uh, with the Google Loon, Facebook drones, and one web satellites, right? Everyone on the planet will have access to the internet for free in five to ten years, okay? Everyone's going to have access to these kinds of devices where you will find applications and XPRIZE Foundation has a, a literacy prize where you take an app. That basically, if you, if you have one of these, let me know. I'll help you get connected. But you win a $10 million prize if you can build an app that totally illiterate person in an illiterate village somewhere, anywhere in the world, can take this and within 18 months gets to high school proficiency uh, reading and writing, right? Just with an app, no human connection. We know that's going to be the future of how we learn content, at least for the short term, or short to medium term, I'll say. Right? This device can be with you 24-7. It can adapt to your learning style. It can pick up on feedback and make sure that you're awake and alert and attentive so you can actually pick stuff up at the most optimized way. The humans are super important in that scenario, right? The big concern about putting computers in, t in schools is that, well, we're going to get rid of all of our teachers. That's the fear, and that's the political fear, and that's, that's where we're kind of battling in, in a lot of places around the world. But the reality is the teachers are even more important in this future scenario because the teacher actually has the opportunity to go back to do what they were meant to do in their life. Teachers, any teachers in the room? Probably a few. Probably if I asked any of you, the reason you become a teacher is because you want to really help someone unlock their potential, find their passion, and set them onto the purpose of what they were meant to do. Help them find that question that they get to dig into and ultimately solve and find the tools that they need along the way. That's the human teacher. That's the human side. Technology is going to do all the rest, right? The technology is going to help us learn the content that we need real time in the most effective ways. But it's the human connection that's going to help us find the right problems, find the right resources, and be effective at solving that. I think the future of the university is the convening place. A lot of it's going to be virtual also. But it's a convening place for us to come together and find that network that's going to help unlock our passion and, and help inspire us to solve better problems and to become amazing citizens of the global society and chart a future for humanity. Now, I'll do a quick future cast. Very quickly, let's, I'll shoot for, say, 30 years, 20 to 30 years. And we should ask, actually, Steve here probably has some stuff in the lab that can verify this. Uh, we, 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 have a, we have a researcher, and this is back to your total recall thing. Um, one of our students from two, two years ago, she works in Hong Kong. She's doing research. And she was able to implant a memory into a mouse, uh, take a mouse that runs a maze, take the memory from that mouse and implant it on a new mouse, and it's able to run the maze. Mm, wow. So wow. here we are. That's the first step to the matrix, right? It's just, it's just the spectrum. So right now, we know we can kind of learn calculus on Khan Academy. Right? It's not great, pretty good, way better than wasting time in school in most cases, right? But then at some point, we just say, oh, I want to learn calculus. OK, here we go. Right? That is going to happen, guaranteed. Is it 30 years? Is it 50? Is it 10? I don't know. But I promise you that's going to happen, right? And as everyone on the planet is connected in five to 10 years, and if you, if you look at the, uh, so I'll go a little farther. Um, so again, we could go for hours on this crazy stuff. The whole world, it, everything is changing dramatically, which as an entrepreneur, you should be so excited. 
My opinion, as an engineer and entrepreneur, this is the best time of all of human history to be alive. The opportunities to solve problems that have never been solved before and the technology and resources you have in your hands has never been seen before. And in five to 10 years, the first time in all of human history, all of humanity is connected. That hasn't happened since the first Homo sapiens sapien, right? Yeah, okay, 22. So, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I can keep Very going. Um, but so that's, that's my quick feeling of, of, of the assumptions that I'm working on at, that, that I think the, the existing universities have to, have to work around. And I think Stanford is doing an amazing job of yes. putting everything online and focusing right. on having a beautiful campus Thanks. that people want to convene. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, in that regard, I am coming back to Daniel because what I wanted to understand is you just said that it's exciting. It's an exciting time for entrepreneurs. Yet I also think that some of you, Daniel, are building companies, you're building businesses. As they build businesses, then what does the future workforce, the future employment scenario look like for, for these entrepreneurs? I come here and I see places that are campuses where people <coughs> sleep, they eat, they socialize, they see their movies here, they're being fed, they're doing everything. What does that future look like then in light of these developments and, and uh, technological advancements? What do you see that future entrepreneurs business looking like? I mean, I think I, I want to react to what you said, but also to Rob's very compelling uh, vision. I tend to be, you know, as the son of a Holocaust survivor, my father was in that house, so maybe that's why I'm always a worry bug. I'm, uh, I, I just always worry about these things. And I do think that we're living through a day and age where the pace of technological innovation is increasing and accelerating. And it's not just in those places. It's also in healthful snacking. I see when I, when I started my first company 22 years ago in the food space, the environment is so drastically different. There's so much more money pouring in. There's so much more competition. There's so much more technology is really accelerating everything. And what terrifies me is that we as humans are not evolving sufficiently quickly to understand our shared humanity to be able to embrace those changes. So for me, there's two things that are essential if we're going to be able to tackle climate change, nuclear proliferation, fundamentalism, extremism, all the dislocations that come from all the transformative change from globalization. I think, number one, we need to recognize our shared humanity. We need to try to find a way for the 7 billion people in this world to understand that we're all in this together. And so teaching empathy and teaching kindness and letting people understand what, would, what brings us together and why are we stronger by celebrating our differences is so essential. And so, in my opinion, unless we as, as a human race start getting those third graders to connect through video conferences with kids that are different from them, and unless we start finding ways to, for these kids from an early age to, to learn empathy, we're going to be in trouble. And empathy, by the way, is not like a soft skill to be nice to one another. Empathy is a formidable skill to solve conflicts to prevent people from killing each other, but it's also a formidable skill for being a better entrepreneur and a better business person. Because if you can put yourself in the shoes of the other person on the other side, you're able to understand their perspective, you can create value, you can overcome conflicts, you can overcome differences, you can find deals. So that's one. And number two is we need to harness the power of the markets because the cool thing about business and small businesses is that, and entrepreneurship is you can be nimble, you can move very creatively, and if you figure out a business model to forge change, it, they're scalable and they're sustainable. So I've also founded nonprofit efforts, and I hate having to knock on people's doors to try to get them to, me, to give money. And some challenges, I haven't figured out how to do them other than through the nonprofit model. But where you're able to use market mechanisms to address a, cha a challenge, you can scale so much faster and you can do it on a sustainable basis. So harnessing the power of markets is, is just critical to be able to solve a lot of the world's uh, challenges. And I think that when, when we look back 10, 20, 30 years from now, and we look at where we're at today, and a lot of people feel like, wow, social entrepreneurship is really coming about, and this is like the golden era of social entrepreneurship. I actually think very differently. I think, yeah, 20, 30 years ago, it was just getting started. Now it's starting to become more of a topic of conversation. But what we define today as social entrepreneurship is going to be like the entry point 20, 30 years from now. Social entrepreneurship is going to be pushed into the boundaries to the degree that we really are going to find ways to advance business models that are self-sustainable 
where you're not relying on the social to sell you products, wares, or services. They stand on their own merits, but you create creative mechanisms to do so. And if I'm not being too long-winded, I'll give you one quick example. I am being long-winded, but I'm still going to give you an example. <laughs> um, so I was just, uh, my first company that started is called PeaceWorks, and it uses business to bring neighbors together. So Israelis, Palestinians, Turks, Egyptians, Jordanians. And it's a very small company. In an entire year, it sells less than kind sells in two hours. But it's a beautiful company because the Israelis that forged relationships with those Turks 22 years ago are still trading with each other together. And we're trying to find ways to scale, ways to scale it. Mm -hmm. And on the other strand, now that kind grew, we, we buy about 1% of the world's almonds. And it's a big problem because as people are finding out the benefits of almonds, demand is outstripping supply because 86% of the world's almonds are grown here in California. There's huge problems with droughts. And it's very hard to find a climate like the Mediterranean climate that was found here in Central Valley of California that is conducive to growing almonds. And, and almonds are dying. It's a very big problem with climate change and droughts. But do you know where they have a Mediterranean climate? In the Mediterranean. <laughs> so we went back, and I just was a month ago in this fascinating place where this Israeli general, this Jordanian general, who were former rivals, are now working together. And they introduced me to this Israeli Orthodox Jews who forged a partnership with Jordanian Bedouins. And they're making the desert bloom. They're hiring Syrian refugees. They have about 200 employees, of which 40 of them are mm -hmm. Syrian refugees. They're making gigantic cabbages that are sweeter than anything, using cutting edge irrigation technology to, to make the desert bloom. They're exporting their wares, not just to the, um, to the Orthodox Jewish markets in Israel, but also to Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. It's really, really cool. And we're now trying to see if we can plant almonds. So you're going to hopefully run a sustainable business that's also bringing neighbors together, providing employment for Syrian refugees, and uh, hopefully providing a counter ideology to the fundamentalism for ISIS and other things that are threatening. That's a beautiful story about empathy. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's right. Thank you. Beautiful. Very nice. Back to the workforce question. Then I'm going to go ahead and turn to you. Tell us about how you see. I think that they want to know with all of these advancements, how does the future workforce look? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm, uh, it's a very topical question for everyone here and for uh, all the younger generations uh, to come. Uh, we have a over 200-person education group, and uh, that group is studying uh, uh, different methodology um, granted by uh, grants through grants and, and uh, funding through, through our government and other governments throughout the world of the best techniques, the best procedures for kids to learn at a very early age. We found that learning math, for example, will, uh, will provide a great future for an individual, wherever that individual is, and not understanding math, that person is, is probably doomed for life in terms of uh, income levels and career growth and that sort of thing. Um, so this, this group of, uh, of, of highly qualified uh, educational uh, researchers are uh, trying to understand better methodology for teacher, teachers, higher quality uh, teaching, not so much teachers, but higher quality teaching, and what can be applied in the classroom as we try to leverage all the different technologies that have been out there, much of which have been kind of wasted, to be, to be perfectly honest. So how do we leverage all the technology that is being uh, brought in to bear and make that uh, adaptable for our future uh, generations as we know that they're going to have many different types of jobs in their careers? Um, my, my grandparents came over from Poland. They worked for 40 years for General Electric, and that's what they were going to do, work on a manufacturing line. Um, turning and moving forward, all of us um, uh, in the room here are probably going to be working for 10, 20, 30 different companies maybe over the years. And that doesn't even include serial entrepreneurs, people who are just bouncing around trying to find different jobs. Half of the Fortune 500 companies are now not part of the Fortune 500 just in the last 15 years. I don't know whether people realize that. So it's not just um, startups that are, that are uh, causing these, these companies to explode. 
uh, but it's also uh, uh, different companies from different industries who are taking over. So we have all new different ways of thinking about it. So we really have to have um, an education system that is dedicated to helping um, kids realize the opportunities in life, not just basic skills, but, but life skills. And in particular, I, I think I would say that one of, my, one of my great areas of interest is in STEM technology, science, technology, uh, edu uh, engineering, and math. Um, for, for women, for girls, for minorities, um, we're just not providing enough, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And for all the problems that, that we are talking about here over the, over the couple of days, mm -hmm. and many more problems, the ones that uh, Secretary uh, Kerry mentioned and other, others have mentioned, we really do need to have uh, much better uh, and more pronounced uh, uh, investment in STEM education for, for all. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's an area that we're also exploring. So Thanks. those will help in, in career growth for, for the, the many more generations to follow. Thanks. And one of the things that um, a former employer of mine would always use were the psychological tests. At, you know, before hiring somebody and to find out propensity for embezzlement, you know, just all the, you know, you know, there's some of you out there. What do you, how does your company empower the employer? Could you talk about, about the, you know, again, they're going to, I assume that every one of the entrepreneurs here is going to have a scalable concept. So how could you talk to us about what the opportunities are for them? With genetics? With genetics, exactly. Well, I mean, right now it's, Specifically, I mean, genetics is specifically prohibited from being used by the employer for any kind of employment. So to, to screen you or to test you, um, you know, so, so right now it's not an option. Um, I think that you could, you know, I think that there's, there's, there's you know, if you were going to think of, you know, what are the different ways it could be used, um, would people ever want it to be used in a way of screening? So, for instance, like we have, you know, our statisticians team obviously is a group of people who love math and they look to see. We just put out a question to our customers asking, like, do you like math? Are you good at math? Or are you not good at math? Like, there's nothing more complicated than that. Um, and they can find that there's actually a genetic association for people who think that they are actually better at math. Um, so... It goes back to some of the other topics that you mentioned before in terms of, you know, just because someone might be genetically more likely to be good at something doesn't necessarily mean they've actually excelled at that. Um, I think that all of us can understand the fact that working really hard at something will almost always beat out whatever your genetic gift is. Um, and I think that to me is actually, when I, when I watch the movie Gattaca, to me that's actually the biggest takeaway, is that you might have had actually a genetic predisposition, but that you, you know, hard work and passion can always help you overcome that. Um, so I don't really see it necessarily being used in that way, but I can see, you know, individuals understanding what they are potentially good at or not good at and, and potentially working harder in those areas where they're not necessarily good at. And, um, you know, especially if they have a passion for it and, and, and potentially dedicating more time and resources. How about politics? Can we use it in politics? You know, Ooh, um, yeah. we once, oh. we, in the, er in the early, this is as close to politics as we've gotten in the early days of 23 Me. um, we did a look to see um, whether or not there was a genetic association between Mac versus PC, um, which is kind of as close as you can get to, the, the, to politics. And we did not find a genetic association for Mac versus PC, but when we look at all the phenotype information, so all the survey questionnaires that we get, there were some like tradition, like what you would expect, like you know, people who use Macs were sort of more educated and more liberal, and, <laughs> and um, so a bunch of those things. So, um, so we have not delved further into the politics, um, but it would be an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Ten-year forecast. Ten-year forecast on genetics for politics. On genetics and politics. Yeah. Um, if, if, I, if sequencing the genome is getting cheaper and cheaper. That's She's something. got five months. She can't wait. wait, wait to hurry up. They, <laughs> they, they, you mean like the genetics of, of sequencing or the well, politics of sequencing? No, no. Um, or the genetics if, of the politicians? If, if it's cheap enough to sequence your genome, which yeah. it will, it's, yeah. it's plummeting, it's going to be virtually free, which yeah. means when you leave, I can pick up your hair and your skin cells and theoretically yeah. know who you are. So a politician, somebody could just sweep up the floor, get their genetics, and publish it. So yeah, is that going to happen? It's one of the things I always... Um, <laughs> we never so, know who these politicians are, though. That's the problem. <laughs> and there's a couple of things. So if you're going to come and like sweep the scene, uh, unfortunately, in the scary way, there's probably a lot of DNA on here already. Yeah, um, sure. So figuring out exactly what is mine might be... I, I'm not sure that would hold up in court of law. Um, so 
Um, so that would be one. Um, but I forgot what I was going to say on the other elements. Um, so, I mean, I think that there's definitely, like, people see that in Gattaca, like, this worry that, like, okay, your genome is, like, it's going to be accessible everywhere. The reality is that, like, as much as everyone in this room, your genomes are very beautiful, I'm sure they're lovely, I'd love to see them, spend lots of time. Um, I'd rather spend time on your bank account. Um, and, and, like, in terms of interest level for people, there's but a is lot your more. genome mapping predictive of what your bank account's going to be? Ooh. I, I would Ooh. argue again there that you're going to have environment and politics, or environment and sort of like hard work be sort of a bigger predictor there. Mm -hmm. um, so my point there is just, I think that people have a lot more interest in looking at money rather than necessarily your genome. And again, mm -hmm. like, it, it might be interesting, like if I looked at Donald Trump and I was like, oh, you know, you're genetically inclined to be, um, you know, <laughs> uh, blank. Um, <laughs> Like, surprise! Like, I don't know, it's so obvious, isn't it? Like, <laughs> so, 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 I mean, I think that that's where it might not be so exciting. That's the thing, like, what I find on your genome, it's really exciting for the individual and for the family because there's this process of self-discovery and, like, knowing where your ancestors came from. And, like, you know, I can look at my chromosomes and my sister's chromosomes and see, like, what we get from each other or from our, you know, different parent, our parents and, you know, it's chromosome six and, you know, who got what from mom and who got what from dad and, like, how we overlap and all the cousins and what they look like. Like, there's a lot of fun in that. Um, and it's really meaningful to individuals to understand their ancestry. Um, there's a really great video that's circulating around now online, and it sort of talks about how people, you know, there's these people like slamming the tape, like, I'm Irish, like, I am Irish, or I'm Turkish, I'm Turkish. And then they get their genome, and they realize, they're like, oh, well, I'm, you know, part Irish, and I'm a little bit of German. And they have the pre-interview where they'd be like, oh, any country you really don't like, and they'd be like, the Germans. Um, and, and then they find out they're part German. And I think that there's, you know, to me, that's one of the biggest revelations, like, in, in a little bit of the Kumbaya, we are the world. Like, we really are all connected. Right. And, and the more that we actually start to see how we're genetically related to everybody in this room, mm -hmm. I think that that actually gets to a lot of these things that we talk about in terms of it breaks down walls and it makes people more open to each other and it will enable more partnerships and enable more entrepreneurship and more businesses. And just because we're not fighting over the silly that we're actually just looking at each other. It's like, people, what are you interested in? How do we work? How do we solve this problem? So I think that that is something I have really been struck um, by how much it impacts people. Mm -hmm. People really, really resonate with their ancestry and knowing where they're from and how they're connected to humanity. Great. Thank you very much. Great answer. Was that great? Yes. That was beautiful. Rob, you are, um, I mean, just such an interesting, you know, coffee conversation. I'd love to have another cup of coffee with you. I have to say, what do you see, I mean, from your prism, what are you most concerned about in terms of the global challenges that just society will face in the future? I mean, you just talked about some of the uh, companies you've invested in. Could you tell us what you're trying to address? Let's get to that. <clears throat> Let's and see. I, I'm now on rapid mode. Yeah, rapid mode. Way. Okay, so, so I have a fundamental belief and some credible insight, I think, that every part of our lives, every business, every industry, and society as a whole is being fundamentally disrupted through technology. Uh, and interestingly, these human processors that we have haven't really had an upgrade for like 50,000 years. And so we're now living in a world that's moving way too fast for us to deal with, and so we need new types of tools to deal with it. Worse than that, our systems, our infrastructure, the, 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 the very things that sort of keep our world together were set up hundreds and thousands of years ago, and wow, those were times that were moving very slow. And are having an incredibly hard time adapting to the pace of technology. And so, so we're living in a time of incredible tension between these amazing breakthroughs and the opportunities to solve problems that have never been solved before and the potential really scary implications of being able to genetically sequence Trump's DNA, right? And, and, and so how, who, who, who decides where it breaks out? And, and unfortunately, I think one of the big challenges, one of the things I'm personally very interested in right now, since this is hosted by the administration, um, our regulatory functions do not work the way that they were intended. Hmm. If we decide that for some reason, for whatever uh, our background is, we don't want to have stem cell, embryonic stem cell research, we say, okay, we're going to stop that. So we stop it. It doesn't happen in the U.S. Does it slow down the exponential curve? No. It moves to China and Brazil and a bunch of other places. We decide that for drones, or we decide that for robotics or AI, or we decide that for any of the number of the amazing breakthroughs that are happening right now. 
Do you think that's going to slow it down? It's not. It's going to move. And so who then is deciding where we want it to go? And, and I think this is where we need, we need a real call to action to everyone to, to look at technology in a different way and to come together to, 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 to really have a dialogue around what do we want the future to look like. Because right now the future, the only vision of the future that anybody talks about is the movies that Hollywood puts out are, you know, the Terminator or the zombie apocalypse scenario, right? There's a few ones that don't really make it very big because we like scary stuff and not the fun, exciting stuff. But we need to talk about a different type of future and then run the experiments to get us there, not to run us to get to the apocalypse. Very beautiful. Okay. Um, let me just ask, go back to SRI. Uh, we at SBA have an Office of Investment and Innovation. We give out grants for those promising ideas that have the potential to scale and, uh, and to create jobs. What do you think, speaking of government, what we should be intentional about, what are the areas that you think we should focus on to make sure that we're really getting at some of the key fundamental human uh, challenges? So, uh, you know, for what it's worth, and I think it's worth a lot, our government actually does a great job relative to many governments around the world uh, in terms of what you just uh, mentioned, Administrator. I get asked a lot, for, for example, about our SBA program. Uh, I've been probably to 20 different countries. I've had two extensions of, of, my, uh, of my passport in the last five years. Uh, we're, we're dealing actively in 30 different countries and helping uh, governments of the world establish entrepreneurial ecosystems. Mm -hmm. We did a survey here, Professor George Foster uh, here at the Business School, along with myself, uh, Endeavor and uh, EY did a survey, which I'm happy to pass along if, you, if people want to send their email addresses uh, that we deliver to the World Economic Forum around this whole area of innovation, entrepreneurship, ecosystems. How, do, how you know, what's the uh, correct way to, to set something up? We actually interviewed over a thousand entrepreneurs all over the world, and in many cases. Um, uh, they've come back with the obvious things. The less obvious ones are, of course, scale, scale capital. Uh, 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 the startup capital seems to be pretty easy to get these days, even if you're in developing economies and, 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 and even in, uh, in frontier economies. Unfortunately, when you do have a good product market match, a fit, uh, and you're ready to go to market, there's no capital, no growth capital between the startup capital, the friends and family capital, um, and, and uh, private equity. So you're stuck. What do you do? Do you come to the U.S.? Who in the U.S. is going to invest in you mm -hmm. if you're in you know, Kuala Lumpur or if you're in uh, Nairobi? Uh, you've got to be scrambling around, and now your limitations are become very, very obvious to you. Mm -hmm. So we have extremely good models here in the U.S. So we actually portray through SRI and actually Stanford University um, here in the business school and other schools to the governments of the world about how to set up um, their, their systems uh, properly. Startup Chile in, in uh, Santiago is a, is a great example of that. What they're doing in Warsaw, Poland, uh, in bringing uh, 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 various innovation techniques to the science and technology sector is, is very promising. What's happening in Japan with Abe uh, as prime minister, he's, Japan's never been known for entrepreneurship. They've been known for a lot of R&D, but it just gets wasted on, uh, on, on the shelves of professors' offices. Now they're trying to commercialize it, bring it through the valley of death, and they're looking for techniques, recipes to make that happen. And so um, government, I think, to finish up, Secretary Kerry, I thought, once again, did an admirable job about uh, government should just be kind of a setup uh, organization, get a great venue like this, put together an agenda, invite some really interesting people, have some hot coffee, available and then get these people to, to work with each other and, and they'll come out with some pretty magical things. Thank you. Now, Anne, thank you. That's a beautiful answer. That was really great. That was great. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Anne, I was recently, uh, just uh, last week in Estonia. They have a very interesting governance model. As you know, everything is online and so you can file your taxes in about, you know, an average six minutes. It's all remarkable. And while there, we visited with the founder of Skype. He connected families in a way that we didn't imagine just a few years ago. And so again, I mean, sort of off, off your subject, but I know that you're a bigger thinker than that. What do you see family life to be in the future? Is it Skype? Is it a hologram? What is the future 
of, of um, how we'll interact with our families around the world because I think we are going to have a more global society. Mm -hmm. And so do you have a sense of where, um, how families will come together? Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, and, and in some ways we, we had this whole discussion actually last night about how the definition of family actually changes mm -hmm. in part. And it's one of the things that 23andMe has done. We have a feature, um, DNA relatives, where people find other relatives within the database. And if you're of Jewish descent, you have over a thousand relatives in the database just because the Jewish population is so, um, has been um, uh, sort of narrowing within the population. Um, so the definition of, of family, you know, is it sort of the people you've grown up with? Is it the people that you're genetically related to? Is it the people that, um, you know, raised you? Like what, what is that definition of family? Um, <laughs> I've been surprised lately. I've been not using FaceTime a lot more when I travel with my kids. I'm really surprised at how much that connects people. Um, that having, you know, and, and the little things, and I, it could be annoying, like I'll call, like I'll get a call in the middle of, you know, dinner, and then they'll kind of sit there, prop it up against the glass, and they can sit there, mm -hmm. and we kind of eat together. And how much that's actually, you know, feels real in a way. Um, so I think that the, the definition of family, I think it, it's going to change with, with everybody in terms of, um, like for me, I'm very close to my family and we all live near each other and we made a conscious decision. I have met other people through 23andMe who were adopted and found out that they were from, you know, areas in the Arctic Circle and they have actually left Silicon Valley and moved to the Arctic Circle area because that's where they felt at home. So that definition of family and what you feel good is going to be very unique for everyone. And I think for me, almost the biggest change is that that definition changes and there's not actually a single stereotype for what a family looks like. Interesting. Very interesting. Again, that's great that's answer. Really Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And Daniel, you're going to help us close it out here. Um, some challenge this notion of this region, Silicon Valley. You know, I was so pleased to see somebody like Bill Gates step forward and say he was going to leave so much of his wealth in the public hands. Uh, Warren Buffett and now the club that's followed and grown and it becomes so impressive. But there's still some challenges and people still are weary of Silicon Valley, whether their intentions are to really have social impact or to create personal wealth. Uh, you know, you're, you're on your way and, uh, and creating a, a great product and building value. Could you talk to us about what you think we need to do maybe as a government, a societal uh, group to make sure that these interests end up being good for society? She has really simple questions all around. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I went to, to law school here at Stanford, and so I got to see it from a different facet also, and I do think that the, there is a fundamental uh, idealism that lives in the Bay Area that's very valuable. And what I've noticed is that as these companies take off and there's just tons of uh, financial growth, it's really, really important to make sure that we capture and, and prize and prioritize that additional facet of who we are, which is social change and caring about making this a better world, not just about making money. Whether it's the government or society in the way we educate and, and talk about these issues, I, I think that life is too short for you to just care about money. Like, what are you going to do with that money? So I do think that as, as we evolve as a society and as our standards of living go up and as we have that income, we're going to start caring about other things that are far more than money. And hopefully, connected to what I said earlier, people are start figuring out that there's a better way to do things than, all right, let me make the money and then let me give it away. Or in the worst case, let me make the money in ways that are not really nice, but then let me clean it up by giving it away. So it's better if the way you make money, you're also making a difference. And I do think that that is the direction that we're moving into. And I think whether it's education or government or culture or ourselves, it is happening. I think it's going to accelerate as we become more evolved, that people are going to expect that from each other because it's just a better way to live. It's not, you're not, None of what I do about trying to build peace or sort of stuff is to do you or anybody else a favor. I do it for my own enlightened self-interest.
to prevent what happened to my father from happening again mm -hmm. to other human beings. And I think as all of us figure those things out and as we have the ability to do it, I do <laughs> fundamentally have a strong sense of optimism that that's the direction we're heading in. Oh my goodness, another one. That's fantastic, thank you. That was beautiful, that was absolutely beautiful. Well, as the administrator of the Small Business Administration, I wish I could have these people over for dinner every night. They've been so inspiring and thoughtful, and it's always a challenge for us who are part of the governance model, part of the USG team, to understand how we can maintain our relevance in terms of the fast pace of what's taking place here. And so I am proud that in addition to our conventional products of consulting, of access to capital, and access to markets, that we also have an Office of Innovation to be able to be forward-looking and understand how we can anticipate these challenges and be relevant in the future. I want to thank you very much for doing us a great debt of service here. And I know that all of these people from around the world will go back home and take these value-laden suggestions and ideas and begin to change the world in a way that will enhance our communities, bring us closer together, and have technology be a force for good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed your, your You were fantastic. Thank you, you so much. I loved your story. Yeah.